Owen Smith won the coin toss, which means he's going to go first tonight. And the first question that I'm going to ask is, when leading the party into a general election, what would your flagship policy be? My flagship policy would be reinvestment in this country. I think we've, for successive generations now, seen many parts of Britain fall behind. I think in particular ex-industrial areas such as the one I come from in South Wales and such as the one where we are today in the North East have felt that opportunities, jobs, outcomes have been better elsewhere in the country and I think it's about time we started evening things up in Britain. I fundamentally believe the Labour is about creating a much more equal society, so I would invest in a British New Deal, £200 billion, a proper Keynesian investment programme in order to get Britain moving once more, investing in the schools, the skills, the healthcare, the hospitals, the housing that we need right across this country. Okay. Jeremy Corbyn. To recognise the National Health Service is the most precious thing we've got, health service as a human right, free at the point of use. Ensure it returns fully to public ownership and public administration of it. Secondly, that we give every child a decent chance and a decent start in life, somewhere safe, secure to live in, so that they can develop their education and live in good health, rather than the insecurity of those growing up in the private rented sector. Preschool access for all children to give them again that equal start in life and not saddle a whole generation of students with greater debts in the future. And a national investment bank of up to £500 billion for investment equally or fairly in every part and every nation of this country so that the inequality of investment decisions is a thing of the past and areas such as the North East can develop the new thriving industries they need and the high-tech jobs that can be created there. So we give every young person a decent chance in life and a secure economy that actually works for all. Just one, one flagship policy then. Which one of those would be your one single one? The most, the most important to me is to ensure that everyone has good health and security. That's health and housing. Okay. <laughs> Moving on now to the second question, which is about the EU referendum, something I'm sure lots of people feel very strongly about. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn's going to go first this time. How did you feel on the 24th of June? And what now is your vision for Britain's relationship with the EU? Shocked, disappointed at the result. Believe that we now have to face the fact the country voted a leave decision in that referendum, but also ensure that we protect the workers' rights we've got, the human rights we've got, the consumer rights we've got, the environmental protection we've got, and above all, ensure that we have access to European markets for manufactured goods from all over this country in the future, and that we have a relationship with the European Union that is a positive one. It may well be that we can be part of a European economic area, or we can have a Norway type of relationship with the EU, but I don't want us to become the bargain basement of an offshore island off the shores of Europe with low corporate taxation, low wages and deep inequality. Owen Smith. I felt gutted. I felt worse, I think, than I did on the day after the general election because we're potentially not going to get another chance uh, to be back at the heart of Europe. And for me, all of the things Jeremy just talked about, all of the things I want to achieve are immeasurably more difficult to achieve in a Britain that is outside the European Union. And I felt deeply disappointed with ourselves, with the Labour Party, because I didn't think we fought anywhere near hard enough in that uh, crucial period to speak up for the big picture about Europe. It's not just about workers' rights and social protections. It's about what we believe in. We're an internationalist party that believes in peace and collaboration, cooperation across this country and between peoples. And the European Union, however imperfect an institution, is about achieving that. And many of the things we want, Jeremy and I both want, better tax controls across the entire European continent, better social protections, okay, that's, that's they'll all be achieved now. in Europe. Just, just to pick up on one thing you said there, you said you didn't think that Labour fought hard enough? No, look, I thought two things. I thought that we... We collectively didn't work hard enough. But the leadership that Jeremy showed, I felt, wasn't sufficient. I stood alongside Jeremy. 
on many occasions and debated this with him. And I thought we had far too narrow a pitch on Europe. I thought we could have made a much bigger argument about Europe. And the reason we didn't is because Jeremy himself admitted he was seven out of ten in terms of his faith in the European Union. He said it. He said it. And what's, what's been disappointing since is that having not made the effort we should have made, Jeremy's been 10 out of 10 when it comes to leaving Europe. He turned around and said, let's quit Europe immediately. Let's trigger Article 50. He said last week that he didn't say it, but we all know he did because it was captured on video. Now, I think that we should still be making a much bigger argument. I think saying trigger Article 50 is like giving Liam Fox and David Davis a blank check to rip up those workers' rights, to rip up those social protections, to argue for a hard Brexit because they don't believe in them. This is an excuse for the Tories to do what they've always wanted to do. And I think Jeremy didn't quite appreciate the scale of the crisis that we would face. We're about to go into another recession in this country. The banks have cut interest rates to the lowest level for 300 years. We're pumping £60 billion worth of our money into the banks once more as a result of the decision to leave the European Union. Okay. We should still be fighting harder. And if I were the leader, I'd be saying to the country, let's negotiate hard. Let's demand that our mandate, because our people voted in by and large, is properly observed. Let's argue alongside the Tories for a proper, right. okay. for a proper Brexit deal. I'm and if it's worse than it turns out, if it now. turns Isn't out it? we've been lied to on the NHS, on immigration, that we should fight to stay in. That's what leadership on Europe would look like for this country. Jeremy Corbyn. I'm guessing you might want to come back on some of that, Jeremy. Well, there's one or two points that need to be dealt with there. Um, yes, I did campaign for Remain vote. My own constituency voted Remain by over 70%, as did London and some other places. Um, secondly, during the campaign, and I travelled to all over the country on the campaign, I did point out that there were problems with the free market vision of Europe that Margaret Thatcher bequeathed to us and, and Cameron was putting forward, such as the attempt at um, enforced privatisation of railways across the continent and a number of other issues, which you cannot ignore, you have to face up to. This is where I put forward the view that I thought Owen agreed with, that there should be a social Europe rather than a market Europe, and I absolutely believe that. And since then, we have set up a Brexit monitoring group led by our Shadow Foreign Secretary. We have been monitoring what's going on. I have been to meet the leaders of all the European Socialist parties to work out a good, close relationship with them in the future about how we protect the uh, rights that we enjoy, how we develop that good economic relationship in the future. That has to be the right way of doing things. But there's no ignoring the fact that whether we like it or not, the decision of the referendum was to leave. And so when I said Article 50, Article 50 is going to be invoked at a point, presumably of either the EU or the government's choosing, but it will be invoked. We have a strategy which is about protection of what we've gained, is crucially about the trading relationship in the future with the rest of Europe. Can I just come back on? Yeah. If I may, because I think this is I think this is probably the most important issue facing the country today. Let's not downplay this. This is an absolute crisis for our country. And this is also one of the biggest disagreements between Jeremy and myself, because I, I don't blame Jeremy for us leaving the European Union. I don't think that for a minute. <laughs> but I tell you what. I tell you what, when Jeremy says his idea of now engaging in this is setting up a monitoring unit to monitor what's going on, and when Jeremy turns around and says, well, we're leaving Europe now, so that's it, there's the big difference between us. I don't accept that we're necessarily leaving Europe, Jeremy. I don't want us to leave Europe. I think that what we will do is we should, as a Labour government, 
be demanding a seat at the table. We should be demanding that we defend workers' rights. We should be demanding that the country knows what the real deal is. Once the lies about the NHS and immigration are cleared out the way, once we know what's really on offer, we may well find that the deal is much less good than the country anticipated. We may well find that working people are going to be significantly worse off. And at that point, Jeremy, you can't be happy, because I won't be happy, and I'm sure you won't be, that we stand by and allow the Tories to exit Europe, knowing it's going to make the people we represent in Islington and South Wales worse off. That cannot be the right thing for the Labour Party to do. It cannot be. So would I give you... I want us to stay in Europe. I still believe fundamentally that we should be in Europe. And I want us to argue hard over the next two years in favour of retaining all those rights. And at the end of that process, if what is on the table for the British people is a worse deal than they were anticipating and a worse deal than this country can put up with, if it is recession, if it is cutbacks, if it is more austerity, we should say no. And we should Mr. win Corbyn. power in order to put it back to them, either at a general election or in a second referendum. In that, Mr. Corbyn, your stance on the second referendum. Owen seems to be ignoring the fact that there's also a lot of political movements happening all across Europe. Some are pro-European integration, some are actually in absolutely the opposite direction. What is interesting is the growth of movements across Europe that are anti-austerity, that are social movements about social justice and the, and the human rights and the, and the way people are treated. And that's why I think we have to have a strategy which builds the best possible relationship with our sister parties and unions all across Europe, whether they're part of the EU or not, hence the discussions we're having with the Norwegians so that, at the moment that, and others. A yes I, no, look, a referendum that. has taken place. And I think we have to recognise that whatever we feel about it, there is a result from that referendum, which we have to work with. Thank you. Thank you. Right, let's, uh, let's move on. Jeremy, Jeremy, what that shows, what that answer reveals, I think, no, is, oh, is the truth, let me finish, what okay, that reveals, on. I think, is the truth that you were never really bought into the idea of the European Union. Oh. It's what it says to me. And what I hear from you is that other countries are contemplating a more protectionist, introverted, introspective future for themselves, and therefore France? we've got to work with that. France? Well, France wants to be part of the European Union, the, unless, the, unless you're the supporting French, there are, Marine Le Pen and those people who want to leave, which I know you're not. Absolutely. So not. I'm absolutely certain so we should be in. And I'm worried. The what this reveals is you've never really liked the oh, idea yeah, of you, the European you seem Union. To be a, are you becoming a mind reader? Well, I don't need to be. I don't need to be. You told us for 30 years you weren't keen on it. No, and no, no, the referendum. You, you, and I, the and go you, and I, and you and I stood on platforms together and argued the case for human rights, environmental rights, consumer protection, environmental protection, market access for British industry in Europe. And we agreed on that. And we indeed, we applauded each other in Cardiff. Wonderful evening we had there too. Why not continue can't to we, argue for them? Can't we agree that what we want to achieve is protection of those things and protection of jobs by that market access. Both of us obviously recognise that if we sever all economic relations with the continent of Europe, then there are investment decisions that follow from that and job decisions that follow from that. We all know that. But I also ask you the question that the Tories, no doubt, will try and push for possibly some kind of TTIP arrangement directly with the United States, as indeed there are elements in the European Union doing that. Surely we have to stand up for what we believe in and what we want, which isn't the enfranchisement of global corporations, which is what TTIP is all about. I agree with you. Right. Let's, um, let's move on now to the next question. Just, just to say so, uh, I entirely agree, and it now becomes okay. even more important that we don't sign up to TTIP, right, having left the European Union. Let's move on to the next question. Good. We've had plenty of discussion on the EU. Uh, Owen Smith, you're up next. And the, question, uh, the next question is about the economy. Can you tell us what your strategy is for working with businesses to create jobs and growth? Owen Smith. Partnership, in a word. 
We know that what we need in this country is more jobs in places like the North East and the part of the world I come from. And the way in which we will do that is by government not doing what the Tories advocate, which is getting out of the way and letting the market deliver because it doesn't. And we know in particular it doesn't deliver for ex-industrial areas like these. What we need is a government that is active and interventionist. That's got a real industrial strategy that looks to the future, that sees what the jobs of the future are and invests. In America right now, the big American car company, Tesla, is investing alongside the American government £5 billion to create the new electric engines of the future. Why not in Britain? Why aren't we doing that in Gateshead or Newcastle? Why not? We could do. And an active industrial strategy in this government would do precisely that. But only if we invest through a British New Deal. Essentially, it is about investment. It is about investment in manufacturing industry. It is about investment in technology and investment in people. So I would start with wanting really good quality apprenticeships for every apprentice, not just those that have the good fortune to work for some of the big companies that get good apprenticeships. Secondly, I'd want state intervention and participation in high-tech jobs and also where inventions, new discoveries take place within this country, a national investment bank that's prepared to support those and invest in those to take them forward to the manufacturing stage rather than exporting those jobs somewhere else. There are, has to be an investment process by government in exactly the same way that Germany particularly and other very successful manufacturing economies have done and sadly we've ignored and become a service economy over dependent on financial services. I've got a question now about defence, which Jeremy Corbyn will take first. In this increasingly unsafe world with a threat of terrorism, what would you do to make Britain safe on a day-to-day -day basis? Obviously, you have to have the necessary security and protection for everybody, airports, ports, and uh, in the streets and what the police actually do. But we also have to recognise our role in the wider world, recognise the failure of the Iraq war and what led from the Iraq war, which is why I opposed the Iraq war at the time and what goes with that. And also a foreign policy, a foreign policy that is, is based on um, human rights, which is based on international law, and develop that into our trade policies as well, so that we become known as a force that is absolutely determined to ensure that the Universal Declaration and European Declaration are enforced in all places. Okay. International law is a very important factor for the future and it's one that I would want to promote. Well, Sophie, I think we all know that the first duty of any government, of any colour of this country, is to keep the uh, people of Britain safe from any form of attack. The Tories, I don't think, have taken that seriously. They've cut back on our police forces across this country dramatically. We have thousands fewer police men and women across Britain, and we are therefore more vulnerable than we were before uh, the Tories came to power. I would invest in our police services. Most importantly, when we consider the issue of terrorism, I'd invest in our communities. The prevent strategy that is grossly undermined and under-resourced in this country ought to be right at the forefront of Labour's policy, making sure that we foster better community relations in Britain and okay. standing up for people right across the country, standing up for their rights and investing where we need it in defence, 2% per annum, taking defence seriously time as Labour always it. has done. To follow up on that question about keeping Britain safe, what are your policies on Trident, both of you? Sorry. On Trident. I oppose the renewal of the Trident nuclear missile system because I do not believe nuclear weapons are a credible form of defence in the 21st century. I believe that. Uh, it's very expensive, and what Parliament voted for, with, which I was in a minority on, actually was a blank cheque to the government on any amount it wants to spend on this. I want to lead a government which will carry out 
our obligations under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which was initiated by a Labour government in the 1960s, which requires all nuclear weapon states to take steps towards disarmament, and crucially, all non-nuclear weapon states not to develop their own nuclear weapons. And I think that has to be the right way forward. They are weapons of mass destruction that will indiscriminately kill millions of people and leave the world in a much worse place with an economic decline across the whole globe and environmental disaster in the area where the nuclear weapon was exploded. I want to see a nuclear-free world. I want every nuclear weapon across the world to be destroyed. We all know that they are appalling and their use is unimaginable. But where Jeremy and I disagree is Jeremy believes that we should unilaterally disarm. He believes that the most effective way for us to rid the world of nuclear weapons is for us to get rid of ours first and then hope that everybody else follows suit. South Africa did that. Some Latin American countries have done it. And America and Russia and ourselves and the other nuclear powers have retained theirs. So my history tells me that it isn't going to work. It tells me that, unfortunately, we will need to retain nuclear weapons for a longer period. And if we are to retain them, that means we will need to renew them. So I will vote to renew the Trident system. I do it with a heavy heart because we all want all nuclear missiles to be got rid of across the world. But I genuinely believe that the most effective way for us to deliver that is for us to negotiate with the rest of the world. Jeremy used to work for trade unions. He knows that you go into a negotiation with something to bargain. Now, if we get rid of ours, if we divest ours, then yes, we will send a moral signal to the world. But will it achieve what we want? Will it deliver a world without nuclear weapons? It would deliver fewer but will it encourage America to get rid of their 7,000 weapons or Russia to get rid of their 8,000 weapons? I think that's just naive. And I think many in the Labour Party have understood that. And there are different views in the Labour Party. But since the 1950s, from Bevan and his uh, generation, I think there has been a view that I hold that the way in which we lead multilateralism is from the forefront, getting rid of ours piece by piece in order to encourage others to do likewise. That, I think, is the leadership position we should be taking on nuclear weapons, not just in this country, but across the world. Okay. The question is, of the awful events that have happened over the past years, would nuclear weapons was our possession of nuclear weapons made any difference? Was 9-11 prevented by the US having nuclear weapons? Was any other of those awful incidents uh, prevented because somebody had nuclear weapons? I think you have to ask yourself the question, why would you have a but weapon of indiscriminate been... mass destruction? And uh, I think we should look at security in the way of protecting ourselves from any indiscriminate act, obviously, but also trying to promote a world of law, of justice, and above all, of peace by encouraging nuclear disarmament, as has happened in a number of countries already. 187 countries do not have nuclear weapons and don't want them. Sorry, sorry, I didn't catch that. Um, you could argue that if something's been prevented, then we wouldn't know because it would have happened. Well, you can always argue that something you didn't know about was prevented by something you didn't know you had. <laughs> but, it becomes but it becomes complicated. Okay. Let's move on uh, to some more domestic so, issues. Be, if, if I may, just on that, just to say... I think it isn't the question whether those things could be prevented, but nobody is arguing that having nuclear weapons means that we could deploy them against terrorist groups. I think it is just a simple question. The question is how we rid the entire world of nuclear weapons, how we have a multilateral process of disarmament. And we've not had a serious conversation about this in the Labour Party or in this country for a long, long time. And I respect Jeremy's position. I think he has a, a, a very moral position on this. But there is a difference between us as to the practicalities of this. And I think, truthfully, it's... 
The moral position is good to have, but it would be a futile gesture for us to get rid of our weapons. And I think we aren't beyond gesture politics. I think we've got to be serious about our politics. Oh, and the world did come together. Um, the world did come together. Uh, it did come together and agree on a non-proliferation treaty and agreed on a number of other treaties, fissile materials and so on. And the five yearly review is a very important thing and indeed we made a lot of progress there when Margaret Beckett was Foreign Secretary. There are serious opportunities to promote all this, but if our message to the rest of the world is that the lights have gone out... Plunged into darkness. <laughs> and are we going to continue, should we continue in the dark or what? <laughs> Ah, yes. Maybe it's time for a question about the energy supply. I love the practicality of the <laughs> mobile phones coming on. Any torches, anyone? I'm the tall one, in case anybody's wondering. I'm, uh, I'm, told, I'm told reliably that well, we are can... working on trying to get the lights back if up. If you can read your questions, there possible. we go. Light. Let there be light. <laughs> got a bit of I... light at the back of the room. I, bl I blame the Tories. <laughs> Ah, yes, thank you very much. It's obviously a fuse. Uh, they're, they're a different set of lights. I think they're the emergency lights that have come on. Uh, the point I was making was, thank you very much, thank you, yes, um, that uh, the Non-Proliferation Treaty gives us that opportunity, and we should take it. Well, in light of that sudden interruption, I think it's only Comedy right that I, uh, of the that Labour I move Party. on. The to... stars above us now. In light of that interruption, I think it's only right to move on to a question about energy supply. Yes. <laughs> so. <laughs> we need a bit more. <laughs> yes. What policies and proposals will you put in place to meet Britain's international obligations on climate change whilst addressing the emerging crisis in energy supply? Whether or not that's been demonstrated. <laughs> I'll leave up to yourselves to uh, determine. I think that's Owen Smith first. Who said irony was dead? <laughs> uh, well, look, the first thing is we've got to do more on renewables. Um, we, we've missed the boat in so many ways on renewables. We had an opportunity to be in the vanguard of uh, wind power. We've got turbines across our country that we failed really to capitalise on. We are still in the vanguard of so many new technologies, hydrogen fuel cells, they're being developed in Britain. Why is it that in Britain we have just eight hydrogen fuel cell refueling points? In Germany they have 400, and they have a target for how many hydrogen fuel cell cars they want to have on the market. We could be much bolder. I'd restore the Department for Climate Change instantly in this country. It was an act of economic vandalism. But I would also make sure that we were capitalising on the next generation of renewables. I think about having a nationalised renewables company. If it makes sense for private companies to invest enormous amounts of money over a 100-year period in, for example, uh, harnessing wind and wave power in this country, why should the government not do that? That's a sort of big idea we need okay. for one of the big challenges we face. Time. Oh, you're going to the lights going out, Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> Thanks. Th thank you. I attended the Paris Climate Change Conference, and it was fascinating to meet people from all over the world, basically all trying to achieve the same thing and sharing the technologies that can do it. We have to innovate and encourage everybody to think about innovation. For example, there's some houses in my, uh, my borough that are heated by spare heat that comes out of the London underground system. There are lots of ways you can innovate that can make, uh, make life much more efficient and generate heat, energy and electricity from it. Last week in Scotland, for the first time, uh, renewables covered the entire electricity needs of Scotland for a period. These things can be done, but they require investment. They require investment by government. They require feed-in tariffs that encourage people to develop solar and other power, and we need to invest far more in renewables in all areas. That has to be the right way forward, and okay. also recognise the need for an environmental approach, which is also about sustaining our biodiversity and our ecosystems. Okay. for a slight change of tone. 
Um, the next question. When Labour swept to power in 1997, it did so as part of the pop culture of the time. Musicians and sports stars identifying with the party, attracting people to vote for Labour. How would you rekindle the spirit? What music do you listen to on your iPod? <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn. I listen to all kinds of music, but um, I, like, um, I like the big classics. I like, uh, I like folk music. I like music that is nice to have in the background, and I like working at home with um, classic FM on in the background. Any particular artists? Well, last night I was, um, I was writing some stuff, and you know what? Beethoven's Fifth was on. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And, but I recognise classical music isn't everybody's cup of tea. Um, what I think we have to do is ensure that all our events as a party are accompanied by music, by dance, by art and by culture, and a society that is accompanied by music, dance, dance art and culture. Owen Smith, what's on your iPod? Uh, oh, loads of stuff. I'm tempted to say, I keep, I keep getting accused, wrongly of course, of being a Blairite in this contest, so I'm tempted to say that Given where we are right now, things can only get better. Uh, However, in truth, the big thing I'm listening to at the moment, my current love, is the vaccines. And I did think that I should have, as for my uh, my campaign theme tune, I'm no teenage icon. It'd be ironic, obviously, Jeremy. And how how are you going to attract more more of that kind of culture and artists to the Labour Party? I think by being a bit more idealistic, in truth. I think the reality is that Jeremy enthused a lot of people last year because he was idealistic, because he was expressing socialist solutions, because he was looking at the big problems we've got in the country. The only problem is I think some of those young people who have been enthused about it are going to be let down because unless we're able to translate that enthusiasm, that idealism into power, then we won't be able to fulfil their dreams. We won't be able to realise the better world they want. But idealism, enthusiasm, dynamism, energy, youth, a new generation, we definitely need a bit more of that. Owen, we've uh, recruited 300,000 people to the party in the last year. And, uh, and, those, and those people are active, those people are determined to achieve a better society. What we're surely about is a a party that's involved in every part of the country, in every community in the country, so that we build up that sense of enthusiasm about what a Labour government could achieve in order to give everyone the kind of opportunities that you and I want for all of them. We all want and are determined to get a Labour government to deliver for everybody in this country. We, we do, Jeremy, but the reality is, if you pick up the papers today, we're at 26% in the polls. That's the lowest we've been since 1982, when I was 12 years old. That's the reality in this country. The further reality is that only a third of Labour voters at the last election think, Jeremy, that you would make a better Prime Minister than Theresa May. That's a further reality we've got to contend with in this country. It may be uncomfortable, but it is the truth. Yeah, but Owen, I mean, we have, um, over the past year, we have uh, won the by-elections we contested, three with a big swing to Labour. We got ahead of the Tories in the local government election. We won four mayoral contests. And we were indeed ahead of the polls until such time as true, a number of people decided no, we'd have a leadership true. contest yeah. instead. Yes. You said that last week, Jeremy, and I know we're in a post-truth era, apparently, but it is not true. It is not true that we were ahead in the polls. We have been behind in the polls consistently. Ed Miliband, at this stage in the cycle, was nine points ahead in the polls. We gained, we lost 18 seats in the council elections across England and Wales. That is the Sorry, worst I'm performance. Just gonna, I'm just going to cut you off. Um, can I just say, excuse me, Excuse me, I know emotions are running high, I know people care passionately, but I would really appreciate it if we didn't shout out, listening respectfully. I just think we've got to be honest with ourselves, comrades. Look, we were 
18 seats down at the council elections. Cameron made 300 gains at the same time. We are miles behind in the polls versus previous administrations. Our popularity ratings are desperate. It is not enough for us to have won either the mayoralties in Bristol, though Marvin is wonderful, or in London, though Sadiq's doing a great job. It isn't enough for us to say we won a parish council election in Thanet. We've got to win back Moneyton and Milton Keynes and Cardiff North and Kingswood. And we're nowhere near achieving that. And my simple message during this campaign is it's not a question of trading our principles for power. I'm no less principled. I'm no lesser a socialist than Jeremy. There are people in this audience who know me and they know it's true. But what I'm not prepared to do is stand by and engage in debate without a prospect of power. Because without that, all of the things we're talking about here today will not be achieved. We need to translate our principles into power. Well, Owen, I think winning council by-elections might not capture all the headlines, but it's nevertheless a good thing to do. You and I were campaigning in Brighton last week, and the result was a massive swing to Labour and an absolutely brilliant result. I think that was great. We should all be pleased about that. Um, but I just say to you that... Uh, if we are to take on the Tories, why did you and others then resign from the shadow cabinet and, and, and bring about a leadership election? which we're obviously now involved in, and that is a debate we're having. I want this to be a debate that goes out to the wider community so that we do give a message to all those parts of Britain that have suffered all the things you and I have discussed, of underinvestment, of bad housing, of lack of proper education, a whole lot of issues, so we reach out to those communities and show that it's the Labour Party and the Labour movement that can put together a programme, put, put together a manifesto that can deliver for all of those people in okay. all those communities. Let's do that. Okay. I resign, Jeremy, because you cannot lead us back to power. I resigned, I resigned because you could not fulfil, not for want of trying, you did try, but you could not fulfil the basic task of holding together the coalition that is the Labour Party. You could not fulfil the task of working with your colleagues. You undermined colleagues at every turn. Sharon Hodgson sat in the front row. Lillian Greenwood, Sangam Debonair. You claim that you wanted us to win those victories on PIP and tax credits. Well, I was the minister in your shadow cabinet responsible for those areas, and I got one meeting with you in nine months. That is not leadership in opposition, Jeremy. Under your watch, we have seen Tory government destroying the legacy of the last Labour government, privatising the NHS, scrapping Sure Start, expanding class sizes, presiding over the biggest decline in wages and living standards we have seen in generations. And the Labour opposition you have led, and which I was part of, has been weak. Far too weak to push back against it. Okay. And we will not win that power with you as our leader. Okay. Owen, um, a year ago, just over a year ago, we had that tragedy of the general election defeat. Uh, in which we were offering people a lot of very good policies, but we were also offering a continuation of austerity policies. We were also continue, offering to continue with the public sector wage freeze, which would again hit the living standards of many people. A month later, it was the decision of the Parliamentary Party to abstain on the Welfare Reform Bill, which was taking £12 billion out of the pockets of the worst off. 
And it yes, was yes, can I finish? Yes, we did win on tax credits and we did win on PIPs. We did work together on that. John McDonnell's department as well as yours, because it's a Treasury issue that uh, delivers tax credits. We did win on that. We did defeat them on forced academisation. We have forced a lot of U-turns out of the government. We could be doing a lot more of that. And I hope we are. And that's what we're going to be doing when this election is over. more questions to get through, and I know that the debate is passionate, but I do want to get through some more questions. Uh, another question, and this one is going to go to Owen Smith first. What is your plan to win back voters from UKIP, especially those people whose primary concerns are about immigration? Well, the first thing we've got to do is we've got to invest in those communities. You could take a map of the areas of Britain that are the ex-industrial areas and overlay that with the parts of the country where UKIP has been most attractive to people and they'd overlap. And the truth is, it is in communities where there has been systemic, long-run underinvestment and where people don't see progress for them and their communities that you end up with people not voting progressively and voting instead for radical right-wing populist right-wing parties like UKIP. So the secret to resolving some of those problems, the secret to a Labour Party, is a socialist programme that invests in those communities, that makes sure there are the school places, that makes sure that there is the health care, that makes sure that there are the opportunities. If we did that, okay. then many of the underlying concerns that people have would be eroded and UKIP would disappear like scotch mist. We have to deal with the question of the undercutting of wages and agreements by importation of often grossly exploited workers through the posting of workers directive which should be fully implemented. We have to implement a migrant impact fund which was introduced by the last Labour government and abolished by the Tories and could be until we leave partly funded by the EU and that funding could be taken over by the UK government. But we also have to challenge UKIP. Because the message they give out is somehow or other that if you blame the person next door to you because they're a different nationality or a different ethnic group, somehow or other, everything's going to get better. In reality, UKIP and the blame culture cannot deliver one house, one nurse, one doctor, one school or anything else. We have to bring communities together by public investment, by community involvement and by development of good services. Now to the next question, and this uh, one goes to Jeremy Corbyn first. Uh, Mr Corbyn, how will you ensure a more gender equal Labour Party? Uh, we have uh, obviously women's organisation within the party and that is a good thing. We have all women short lists, lists on a lot of parliamentary selections, that is a good thing. I think we should uh, develop that and I think we should ensure that there are women candidates selected where we can for mayoral elections and other elections so that we do get a proper, um, proper gender balance in public representation. But as a party we should also be promoting policies that bring about a much better gender balance within our society, encouraging girls to go into science and engineering as well as uh, any other profession they wish to, but also end the system, which is a systemic problem, of effectively some jobs and some professions become almost women only, almost men only. We have to encourage real equality and real equality within our society and absolutely close the gender pay gap and ensure proper monitoring okay. of the pay arrangements of every large company. I think we start by acknowledging that we've not been good enough. Now, the Labour Party can be very proud. We can be very proud that we've got 99 women MPs. We can be very proud that we've been far more progressive than any other party in history in this country. In Wales, we were the first gender-balanced cabinet anywhere in the world in the Labour Party. We can be proud that we used AWSs in order to secure 
women in Parliament. We've got to do all of those things. We've got to go further. We've got to make sure that the Shadow Cabinet is gender equal, at least. We've got to make sure the top jobs in the Shadow Cabinet and the Cabinet are shared equally, perhaps more than equally, between men and women. But truthfully, we've got to do a lot more, because the reason we've not succeeded in bringing forward more uh, women leaders in our party is the culture of our party hasn't been encouraging enough. It is tough to get on in politics in the, if you're a woman. It is tough in the Labour Party That's to do fine. that. And we've got to encourage and sustain and nurture okay. the next generation of women leaders. Okay, let's move on. I'm interested... I feel it's quite a timely question because this week Labour ele uh, selected men for their mayoral candidates uh, in places like Liverpool, Manchester. Would either of you have supported an all-women shortlist for at least one of those mayoral seats? Mr Corbyn first. Uh, it, yes, but it would have to be made by the region that was, was choosing that, and I think we should encourage that. Um, I don't think it's, the, it's right for party leader to interfere in selections all over the country. I think there has to be real democracy in our party. There has to be proper support for women candidates and support for all candidates. I, I also think that uh, when we put people up in uh, parliamentary selections, they get selected. They then have to work very hard over a number of years to uh, try and get elected as the MP on behalf of our party. We don't give them enough support. We don't give them enough financial support. And there are colleagues who worked really hard to get elected last time round, tragically were not elected, have ended up actually very hard up as a result of it, often lost careers and career opportunities. The party must give them more practical help and support during the campaign and after the campaign. Yeah, I mean, I, I slightly disagree with Jeremy on this. If I were the leader, I think I would have looked at the fact that we were selecting three really big mayorities in Liverpool, Manchester and Birmingham, and the party leader should have insisted on one of those at least being an AWS. Because we know, we know that unless we use mechanisms such as AWS, we don't get women selected in the Labour Party as in other parties. We do need to have that positive discrimination. And when I was the Shadow Welsh Secretary, I was very proud that we changed the culture in the Welsh Labour Party. We saw uh, many more women being supported through the Welsh Labour Party, and we saw many women being selected through AWS and without them. We also pledged in Wales, uh, in what I'm incredibly proud of, to equalise the number of male and female councillors. We should use AWS as council selections in order to guarantee that our party, at every level, looks like the country we want to serve. Okay, let's move on. Well, if I can just add to that, I, I think we should also ensure that we get far more shortlists that include people from black and minority ethnic communities and include people with disabilities. So that, so that the party... And Owen's right, so the party as a whole, in its public representation, does look more like the country we live in. That has to be what we do. But it's also about what we do for the country we live in, about giving everyone a decent chance. So the discrimination that exists against women, against black and minority ethnic communities, and against people with disabilities has to be challenged. Let's move on to another question. Uh, and it's Mr Corbyn who's going to go first this time. Uh, why do you think that Labour failed to win the last election and in particular had the terrible losses seen in Scotland? I think we lost the last election because we were not offering anything totally different from what the Conservatives were offering. I got so much stuff on doorstep saying, yes, I agree with most of what you're saying, I like most of it, but... And then the but was always about, are you going to be able to reverse local government spending cuts? Are you going to be able to reverse the uh, pay freeze on public sector workers? Are you actually going to have a different economic agenda? And whilst I agreed with an awful lot of what was in our manifesto, particularly the ending of zero-hours contracts and issues like that, I think we needed to be much bolder on our economic strategy. 
We lost Scotland not in the last uh, year. We lost Scotland some years ago, and we have to do everything we can to support the Scottish Labour Party and try to win it back. We did gain one or two territorial seats in the recent elections, but there is a huge uphill task to be faced in Scotland, and I do think that the SNP strategy of, de uh, of depending on That's oil fine. revenues for a future economy of Scotland is something that surely has to be questioned. It's something we have to question and put okay. forward an economic strategy which is about security for everybody in Scotland cool, of decent time. living standards. I think we lost the last election because we were far too unambitious. We all know that the country faces massive problems, that this is a very divided, in many respects, angry country right now, where lots of people feel that we're going backwards, that there isn't progress for their communities. And Labour didn't offer a big enough story about why that had gone wrong. We didn't explain what had happened since the 1980s and the change in our economy, the shift towards financial services, the shift away from being a much more equally spread economy across the country. And we failed to offer really big solutions. And we are making that same mistake again. Because at the moment, we're great on slogans. We say we're anti-austerity, I'm anti-austerity, but we've got to describe what it is we're going to do. We should have been, over the last 11 months, putting in place our plans for a British New Deal. We should have been spelling out exactly what workers' rights we were going to restore and enhance. We should have been time. saying what we were going to do to invest in the NHS and where we were going to find the money. If we don't do that quickly, we'll lose the next election okay. too. Okay, the next question might be a bit of a challenge for both of you because I know how much the politicians are able to talk at length at, at times. So I'm going to ask you to sum up in one sentence only, and I'm going to be strict on this. Uh, to each of the candidates, in one sentence, what makes you think you could be Prime Minister? And that is going to Owen Smith first and then to Mr Corbyn. Because I understand this country, its problems, I understand why it's a fantastic country that could be far more and I think I've got the ideas the energy and the passion to change it I believe in people, their good sense their good humanity and their determination to live in a decent, fair and equal society politicians can be brief. I know, I'm impressed. <laughs> you managed it, both of you. <laughs> Against all the odds. <laughs> uh, right, the next question is going to uh, Mr Corbyn first, and it is, what would you do as Prime Minister to end educational inequality? Education inequality starts at the very beginning when some children get to go to good nurseries, some children get, don't get to go to any nurseries at all, and they lose out as a result of it. So I'm absolutely determined to grant good quality nursery education for all children before they get to primary school. I'm also very keen on restoring fair funding to primary schools. At the moment, school budgets have been cut by the, for the first time by, um, by central government. And so we start at that end. Then take it forward. I think there are too many obsessions with league tables and competitions between schools and the introduction of... Um, and the introduction of academies and free schools has been, I think, basically a very bad thing for our society. So I want to restore the family of education through local education authorities bringing schools together. Well, I'd start by reinstating the Sure Start uh, centres across this country. My, my children benefited from them. Uh, I think they are a great labour invention. I think it is an act of educational vandalism to be destroying them. I would invest in our schools. Our buildings are inadequate. Getting rid of the Building Schools for the Future programme was another 
destructive act by the Tories. We've kept it in Wales, and in my constituency, we are building or rebuilding eight new schools. And my wife is a school teacher, and she sees the damage that is done by class sizes that are too large uh, and by having an inadequate number of teachers and classroom assistants. So I would invest in new training of assistants and teachers. And finally, I agree with Jeremy. Academisation and forced academisation in particular is a disaster. We should have education controlled by local authorities and local education boards, and I would reinstate that on day one. You both said that you want uh, schools being controlled by uh, local authorities rather than academisation and free schools. Does that mean that you'd be prepared to shut down existing free schools, even if they're popular and successful in the, no, in the local community? I wouldn't close them down. I'd bring them into the local authority orbit. But they would be shut down as free schools. Uh, but I would also question the way in which uh, the funding is done at the moment. Central government will only provide money for free schools or academies to be established. So when you have a local education authority that wants to develop a new school, the only way it can do it is through an academy or a free school in England. That cannot be right. So you and would, so I would just, just to be clear, you would bring the free school under local authority yes. control? Yes, bring it into the orbit of the local authority, yes. Yeah, the last thing we should do is close down schools, but we absolutely shouldn't have schools floating off. There's no, there's no coincidence that the Tories have sought to uh, force through academisation, subverting Labour's policy. It's deliberate. They don't believe in comprehensive education. They don't believe in there being uh, equitable standards across the country. I was in Durham earlier on today talking to a classroom assistant whose academy is cutting her terms and conditions. That's happening right across this country, and it will result in a patchwork of education, with some children having a poorer education than others. Okay. We in the Labour Party should never put up with that. And the way in which we guarantee greater on. equity is making sure that there's local educational control in local authorities. Let's move on. Now, as, as, I, as I read out the next question, I think it's going to be very apparent that it's not me writing it. I don't think, sadly, I can define myself as a young person anymore. Uh, it was from a Labour Party member. So, as someone who is young, not me, the person writing the question, uh, I look forward and see I'm part of the first generation, generation promised to earn less than my parents. What will they do and how will each candidate strive to make the world tomorrow better than yesterday? And that is going to Owen Smith. Well, the first thing we should do is end this con job of the living wage that the Tories have introduced at £7.20 an hour and end the unbelievable decision not to apply it to anybody under the age of 25. What on earth is the rationale for having two people, one age 26, the other age 24, with exactly the same outgoings and perhaps exactly the same circumstances, one earning less than the other? So I would introduce a proper living wage at £8.25 an hour, rising to more than £10 over a five-year period, and I would introduce it for every adult in this country. So if you were 18 to 21, you'd have a £5,000 pay rise. If you were 21 to 24, you'd have a £3,000 pay rise. And everybody else in the country on the minimum wage would get a £2,000 pay rise. And I'd introduce That's wage fine. councils in order to guarantee that they kept those wages in future. Oh, he's right on the, on the issue of wages. He's right on the issue of the youth rate for the minimum wage. The issue, the big issue, is essentially that we've all been lectured uh, for the past 30 years that somehow or other the next generation is going to be worse off than us, the next one after that is going to be even worse off, and the one after that is going to be in a very bad state. Sorry, the world is an infinitely richer place than it was 30 years ago. Technology has moved on massively. What hasn't moved on is the politics of redistribution. Instead, we have the politics of, of greed and narrowness. And so I want to see an economic strategy that redistributes wealth and does give the next generation access to university education that I could have had for free, that gives the next generation access to the good pensions that they ought to be getting, gives the next generation access to the sort of jobs and training that they are being denied at the present time. It's a question of making sure the next generation is better off okay. than this generation, not worse off.
think it feels like the lights are coming back on us, so maybe it's like a sign of a brighter future ahead, who knows? Uh, right, let's move on to the next question. Um, and this one is going to uh, Mr. Corbyn first, that's right, isn't it? Yes. At the last general election in 2015, people did not trust us with their taxes and the country's finances. What actions will you take as Labour Party leader to restore Labour's economic credibility? To be absolutely clear that we will chase down those that evade tax, we will learn a very big lesson from the Panama Papers on the industrial scale of tax avoidance and tax evasion, we will deal with people like Philip Green that think they can rip off a company in this country and live in a tax haven, and that we will invest in an economy that does provide the good quality jobs and services that we need and will finance our public services in a more traditional way through the public, so public sector loans board, public works loans board, rather than the private finance initiative which is such a huge problem for so many hospitals and schools. And I would also say we'll put a whole message out there for young people in this country about what they can expect in the future from a Labour government and hopefully encourage more than half of them to take part in that election and vote. Well, I'd said about reintroducing fairness in our tax system. It's been too long without a, a real reform programme. And I'd also seek to connect people's understanding of what they pay taxes for to the public services. So, for example, I'd reintroduce the 50p rate on the earners over £150,000. I wouldn't be going ahead with the inheritance tax cut that allows millionaires to pass on their homes. I wouldn't go ahead with the cuts to capital gains tax that benefits the wealthier in this country, I would introduce an increase in corporation taxes. We've cut them now to seem to be 17%. That's half the rate of America. Does anybody think that is morally or economically unacceptable in this country? Because I don't think it's acceptable. I wouldn't go ahead with any of those Tory tax cuts, and I would introduce a wealth tax in this country, a surcharge on unearned income, people earning over £150,000. And I would devote that money to our NHS. 4% per annum every year for a five-year period to get our NHS back to where it needs to be at something like the European average. The last Labour government okay. had to fix the NHS and the next Labour government will have to do it too. know if either of you accept the premise of the question, that at the last general election people didn't trust Labour with the country's finances? I think people were confused as to what our economic strategy actually was. I think that was the problem. And I think if we're there saying that we are intending to have good quality funded public services, we're not going to allow PFI to rip off private finance initiative, to rip off the National Health Service and our education system, and we're going to invest in infrastructure and industry, which will bring about those jobs and that expanded sustainable economy, I think that's a very strong message. I think that's a very attractive message to a very large number of people, rather than what the Tories are offering, which is lowering corporation tax, tax avoidance on a great scale by the very wealthy, lowering tax rates for the, at the top end, and either raising them at the bottom end or just cutting the services that are so vital in so many won, poor communities across the country. The Conservatives Britain. did win the last election, though. Yes, they, they got a majority of seats in the last election, obviously, and therefore we have to say, listen, what you've now got is bigger cuts in local government expenditure, more cuts and closures, more homelessness, more poverty, more inequality and injustice in Britain. Are you actually comfortable with a society that is so unequal, with such levels of disgraceful poverty that is so unnecessary? I think you have to make a moral argument for the kind of society that I think everyone in this room really would prefer to live in. I think we did lack credibility on the economy at the last election. I think the Tories successfully hung around our neck the lie 
that it was labour spending on schools and hospitals and healthcare and infrastructure that led to the economic crash. We all know that was a lie. We all know it was the bankers. They agreed in the obscurity of our system that led to the crash. And we should have been much stronger in that last period of opposition at telling the truth to the country about that. Much, much stronger. But this time round, we've got to describe what we're going to do in concrete terms. And we haven't been doing that. We haven't been spelling out the sort of concrete policies I'm talking about. Nor have we been saying what we would do for uh, average earning, middle earning people in this country. The pension system is ripping off average workers in this country. The benefits accrue to those people who are wealthiest. So I've said very simply, let's reform the pension system. Let's have a flat rate of tax uh, give back in that system. Around 25%. It would mean a massive benefit for working people in this country. And if we tell that story about how we would change the system, make it fairer, and spend it on the things that everybody relies on, the NHS, our school system, the councils to collect the rubbish at the end of the week. That's what people care about in every part of Britain. And if we told that simple story of what we would do, how we'd raise the money, and how we would improve services across Britain, we would win the election. Come back on that at all, Owen Smith, saying you haven't got enough concrete policies. Well, that's exactly what we're trying to do, Owen. So I'm very disappointed that you chose to resign when you were putting forward exactly that policy. I resigned because you weren't putting them in place, Jeremy. You were big on policy 11 months ago, and you've been big on it since. In between, I don't know what you were doing. We have to put forward economic policies that bring about justice, that we all agree on. We have to put forward those economic policies that people can understand, and we have to campaign for them between now and the general election, whenever it comes. And that is what we're going to be doing, and that is really what we ought to be doing But we now. need more than rhetoric, Jeffrey. We need more than rhetoric. We need concrete proposals. People in this country, people in this country are incredibly cynical about politics. They're incredibly cynical about politics, and we've been long on slogans and long on rhetoric and short on substance and short on solutions. And we will not win back trust. We will not win back the confidence of the British people unless we have a much more concrete programme. The rhetoric may well appeal to our base, Jeremy, but it won't win us back. Nuneaton, Milton Keynes, yeah, Cardiff North, 106 Labour seats we've got to win. Well, the strategy that um, John McDonnell has put forward on investment, the analysis he's done of the Tory budgets and what they've done to the people of this country are, I think, a very good pointer of how we want a Labour government to be measured on how it reduces inequality, how it supports uh, a, a sustainable environment, the impact it has on women and their lives, a whole lot of different ways of looking at how you do things. All those ideas are there. All those ideas are being put forward. All those analyses are there. All that campaigning is there. The economic conferences we're holding all over the country are very much part of that. Let's get to it as a party and get out there and involve people in developing an economic strategy. Jeremy, you say, you say it's all there. You say all the policy is in place. It isn't. The truth is, it isn't. It hasn't been, it isn't now, and it isn't enough to persuade the British people. Two-thirds of Labour voters tested in this country in recent days did not think you would be a better Prime Minister than Theresa May. That is the reality we are facing. And without that... All of the policies we want to put in place, all of the principles we hold dear are worth naught because we will not be able to translate any of that into power. We will not be able to transform the life chances of a single child in this country if we are in opposition. Oh, in our party is a strong party, our party is a big party, our campaigning abilities are immense. If we work together, 
on those campaigning abilities. I, I just say, Jeremy, we've been here before. I say we've been here before, and we've been here in my lifetime. We've had mass rallies, we've had a big party, and we've lost successive elections. We know how this one ends, Jeremy, and it doesn't end well for the working people of Britain. You know, it's not about the T-shirts we wear and the badges on our lapels. It's about power. It's about power. It's about delivering power for the British people. It may be uncomfortable, but it's absolutely true. Okay. It's a I very know. lovely T-shirt. It's a very lovely T-shirt. If we can try and keep the booing It won't win us an election, though. That would be great. I think people should wear any T-shirt they want to. It's what they do together that's important. Okay, I know that I know that emotions are high and ch clapping what you agree with, that's, I haven't got a problem with that at all. If we can keep the boon to a minimum, I think that would be respectful. Thank you. Okay, right, let's move on to the health service, something I'm sure people are very interested about in this room. Will Labour's next Prime Minister increase the NHS budget, and if so, where specifically, and I would like this part of the question as well, where specifically would you find the money from? Where would you fund it from? Uh, and that is going to Owen Smith first. Uh, I would increase the budget of the NHS every single year by 4%. That would take us to where we need to be, which is at the European average as a proportion of our entire country's wealth being spent on the NHS. It's vital that we do it. I would raise that money by increasing taxes on corporations, introducing uh, a wealth tax, reversing the Tory inheritance tax, uh, increasing the 50p rate on people earning over £150,000. Specific policies that would raise easily enough money to fund our NHS and exactly what Labour should be promising the country at the next election. The principle of an NHS as a human right free at the point of use is an essential one. It's absolutely in the DNA of our party. Secondly is the question of health inequality in Britain. You can take a trip across any major city and you can watch the uh, levels of life expectancy fall as you move into a poorer area and rise when you move into a richer area. You can also look at the way in which mental health services are chronically underfunded and we have a society and a language that is far too often almost demonising of people with mental health conditions. We need to have real parity of esteem in those areas. I would also say that the funding of the NHS should come through increasing corporate taxation where necessary, but also recognise that the problems of PFI and the problems of the costs of the NHS also have to be dealt with in a number of ways, and that brings in the question of national investment in new health facilities rather than the, what I think is actually the curse of PFI on so many hospitals across this country. of government spending that either of you would be comfortable seeing cut? Mr Corbyn. Oh, what I'd like to see in the case of the NHS is greater use of generic medicines rather than patented medicines where it can be achieved. Um, I, I think there are areas of saving that could be made on the levels of consultancies, agency working and contracting out of public services, which actually result in enormous profits. And take, for example, um, East Coast Main Line worked well, efficiently, paid a lot of money into the Exchequer. Virgin East Coast seems, from my experience this morning, much less efficient than uh, East Coast Main Line was, but the staff are absolutely brilliant. And so it says, it's a bit of a lesson there that if you run services directly, where there isn't a profit motive of somebody else involved, the only motive is in the delivery of service, as is there within the NHS. So I'd repeal the Health and Social Care Act to end the privatisation of our health service. Mr Smith, any areas 
the spending that you'd be happy to see cuts? Yeah, I'd cut back on some of the ways in which we've floated the banks in this country. We've just spent another £60 billion trying to push capital through to the real economy. We know it isn't working. £375 billion worth of quantitative easing in the last six years, and we're still teetering on the brink of another recession. There are far more effective ways in which we could be getting this country moving through a regionalised bank system, through the British New Deal that I've talked about, borrowing by government in order to invest in our communities. It would be far more efficient than the way in which we've gone about it in recent years, and it would guarantee that we were spending money where we need to spend it, in the communities that actually need investment right now, like the North East, like Wales, like the South West of England, the parts that it could be driving our economy forward and aren't. Okay. Uh, right, the next question uh, that we are going to uh, have a look at is... Can war ever be justified? And this is quite a deep question. I'm going a bit existential here. Uh, Mr Smith, can war ever be justified, in your opinion? Yes, it can be. Um, when I was 14, uh, I was taken by my father to uh, meet a man in a pub in pont de He was a man called Will Painter, who was a miners' leader uh, who died shortly after I met him. Uh, and Will Painter was one of the hundred and odd... Well, I think laughing at the memory of a very great man in this country is deeply disrespectful. Uh, Will Painter was one of the hundred and odd uh, South Wales miners who went to fight uh, against fascism in Spain uh, in 1936-37, and he's a great hero of mine. Uh, and he absolutely understood that there is a patriotic and principled case for intervention on occasion, uh, he absolutely understood, of course, that the Second World War was another instance where this country bravely stood up against fascism. And we always have to guard against jingoism. We always have to guard against uh, illegal wars. I've said already that I think Iraq was wrong and I wouldn't have voted for it were I in uh, Parliament at the time. And I agree with Jeremy that we should have a War Powers Act in order to prohibit that in future. But I am not a pacifist. And I believe that there is a long and honourable tradition of intervention across the world. And there are instances, such as in Rwanda, in recent memory, when we should have intervened and we didn't. And it's to, to their cost and our shame that we didn't. I think it's very hard to say an absolute never because you look at the liberation wars that have taken place. My parents met through the Spanish Civil War and recognize some of the grotesque injustices that have happened. But you also have to adopt a policy and a strategy which is about trying to prevent wars and prevent all the wars of the future. And you don't do that by selling arms to oppressive regimes that then go and invade somebody else such as Saudi Arabia and what it's doing in Yemen. And you also have a foreign policy that is heavily based on the promotion of human rights around the world and international law around the world. Because the Chilcot report on Iraq makes pretty sobering reading for an awful lot of people how we ended up somehow or other in cahoots with George Bush going into a war that we knew was questionably legal, we knew was morally wrong, and many were very well aware of what the possible and indeed likely and now proven consequences of that war actually are. And I just think we have to have a different less aggressive approach to foreign policy, but above all, one that tries to promote human rights and justice around the world rather than the idea of wars which are sometimes, not always, but sometimes, essentially about grabbing resources from poor places around the world. Staying on defence for a moment, um, do you believe, um, Mr Corbyn and then Mr Smith, um, do you believe that the UK should maintain its 2% of GDP for defence spending 
or do you think that should go down or up? We're not actually quite spending 2% and there is some evidence that uh, some of that is used on other things anyway. Uh, I would like us to live in a world where we spent a lot less on defence and that um, we would hope to be able to reduce it in the long term. I recognise there are defence needs, I recognise that there has to be a level of spending but I would hope in the long run to reduce it. Uh, Mr Smith. Well, I would maintain it. Uh, I think that the world we live in has become a more unpredictable, a more volatile, a more risky place in the last 10 years, the last 20 years than it was in the first 20 years of my life. And I think we've got a duty as Britain. We are a, a leading nation in the world for all sorts of historical reasons. And therefore, we have a duty to play our part alongside other countries when moments come when defence is required, either of our people or of other people's. And when I see the prospect of Donald Trump in power in America, and I see Vladimir Putin in power in Russia, I think it's evident to all of us that now is not a time for Britain to shirk its responsibilities. Of course we all want a, a peaceful world, a world where we don't have conflict. But it's naive to imagine that that's going to come about any time soon. Okay. We can work for it, we can work for it, and we should all work for it, but we need to uh, plan for the best and be ready if the worst occurs. Okay. So we've got, time, um, we've got time for just a couple more questions. Uh, there's just a couple more that I want to try and squeeze in. Uh, I think we've covered quite a broad range of uh, subjects so far. Uh, the one thing that I did want to ask uh, is to Mr Smith first and then to Mr Corbyn, Will you commit to affordable childcare measures as one of your policies going forward? Yes, we must. Uh, the awful truth is that we were outbid by the Tories at the last election on childcare. What a terrible position for Labour, the party of the family and the party of childcare in this country, to, to end up in that position. So we should be very clear that the way in which we enable the maximum number of people in this country to engage in the workforce, the way in which we enable women in particular who have borne such a, a, a brunt of the cuts in recent years to engage at the level of work that they want and they need, uh, childcare is essential to that. So we must do that and we must commit to ways okay. to fund it. Childcare is obviously essential so that parents can go to work if that's what they choose to do. It's also essential for the good of the child that they be brought up and grow up in an era of, in a community of social interaction. And so I want to see all children having the option and the opportunity of a preschool place. And so what we did with um, children's centres, what we did in bringing in Sure Star and all those issues was actually groundbreaking and magnificent in that it changed the lives of a lot of people in other communities because parents come together through their children and so that wonderful community you get around the primary school gate the nursery uh, arrival in the morning is something that actually develops and grows into the whole community and the child grows up understanding the importance of people interacting and a community bringing them together. So it's important for all of us that our kids learn to play together and learn together in a good way from the very beginning. I just wanted to add, Sophie, that the, the, the other big gap in Britain is in respect of equality of gender pay. It's all very well providing childcare for, in particular, more women to take their place in the workplace, but it's 46 years, all the years I've been alive since Barbara Castle introduced the Equal Pay Act, and it's time for a new one, because we've still got a 20% pay gap between men and women in this country. And frankly, it's not good enough for my daughter to face the prospect of earning a fifth less money than my son. So I would commit to introducing a new Equal Pay Act in Britain, a 21st century Equal Pay Act, in order to eradicate that gap once and for all. I think we're agreed on that. There has to be uh, tougher legislation on gender pay gap and the points that we made earlier about the effective way of 
jobs being almost reserved for women, reserved for men, and that actually masks a whole level of inequality in, in pay. And also the career options of women are often diminished by uh, the way in which uh, companies encourage sort of social interaction in the early evening. The men are quite happy to go and have a drink with all their mates. The women are far more responsible and go and look after the children they, they're bringing up. The men should Some do women. the same. Not all. <laughs> Thank you. Right, we've got, I'm going to try and squeeze in just one final question uh, before I ask the candidates to give their summaries uh, of their arguments. Uh, and this question is going first to Jeremy Corbyn and then to Owen Smith. And it is, what would be the first actions that you would take to unite the Parliamentary Labour Party and the wider party as soon as you're made party leader and leader of the opposition? Mr Corbyn. I will ask the Parliamentary Labour Party to come on board with the, and recognise the results of the election, recognise the ten points that I put forward in, in this election campaign, and also recognise that they are a part and a very important part of the Labour Party and the Labour Movement, and our responsibility, our job in Parliament, is to put out that case there for equality, justice in Britain, to put out that case for housing and education, put out that case for health and all those things and take on the Tories and what they're doing to our society. And I say to all members of the Parliamentary Labour Party, let's get on board and get together and put it to the Tories. Well, I'd start by doing something that Jeremy unfortunately can't do, and I would put together a shadow cabinet of all of the talents of the Labour Party. And that's what I do. I'd bring together the best and brightest from right across the Parliamentary Labour Party, and I would command their support, as I have commanded their support in this contest. And the reason I would be able to do that... The reason I would be able to do that is they know that I would be able to lead them effectively against the Tories. They know I would put in place a programme. They know I would support them. They know I would take the Tories on effectively and efficiently at the dispatch box. And they know I would stand up for working people in this country and implement the socialist programme that I believe in. That's what I can do. Okay. Jeremy can't do that. And that's why we need to change the leader of the Labour Party. Before I ask for the summary, if, if you lost, if you lost, would you be happy to serve in the other can candidates' shadow cabinet? I think it's very unlikely I would offer me anything. <laughs> but I would, offer, I would offer, as I did last September, positions that ensure the but political spectrum in, is you, represented would you within serve the in Owen's shadow cabinet. Well, I don't think he's going to offer me one. So of course, the, I would. I already have that. Oh, okay. I'm very clear, Jeremy. If, if oh, I, I would absolutely good. want you to be in the shadow cabinet, does that mean you're going to come back? No, I've lost confidence in you. <laughs> okay, all right. I've lost confidence well, in Owen, you. Well, uh, Owen, so I, I will serve Labour on the back benches because I am Labour to my bones, and I will always be Labour. But I would serve this party on the back benches loyally. I won't do what Jeremy Corbyn did and vote against this party, my party, Owen. 500 times. I would do what I've always done. I vote Labour. I mean, that is, that is genuinely disappointing to me. I was pleased when you accepted the position of Shadow DWP last year. I was disappointed when you resigned from it. I would have thought you would want to continue that kind of work. Right. I do, Jeremy. I do, but I don't want it to be fruitless, futile work. I want it to be work that is leading to a Labour government that allows me to put into practice what I want to preach to the country. I don't want to be engaged in a protest movement talking to oh, itself. Yeah. OK, that is all the questions we've got time for. You can come back again in a two-minute summary if you want to. Um, thank, you. thank you for listening on the whole. Very respectfully, um, that's much appreciated. And we are now going to move... Uh, to the candidates' two-minute summation, and we are going to speak to Owen Smith first and then to Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Smith. Thanks, Sophie. 
I grew up in the 1980s in South Wales under a radical right-wing Tory government that was determined to strip away social security, that was determined to break our trade unions, that was determined to underfund the NHS, that was determined to reduce wages for working people. And we're back there again. We've got a Tory government right now in this country with exactly the same issues and exactly the same intentions. And I'm not prepared to wait 18 years to get rid of them. I'm not prepared to wait 18 years for us to get our act together as a party this time and get them out. Because they're still intending to privatise the NHS. They're still intending to scapegoat disabled people in this country. They are still stripping away the wages and the workers' rights of ordinary people in my constituency and Jeremy's. And those people, they can't wait 18 years. They can't wait 18 minutes for another Labour government. So I'm very clear. I want to lead a Labour government. I want to introduce fair taxation in this country. I want to deliver a revolution in workers' rights in this country. I want to introduce proper fair funding for every corner of Britain, getting us off our knees and turning us once more into the engine room of the global economy. But we can only do that. We can only do that if we're in power. We can only do that if we are a Labour government. So if you give your support to me, if you give me a chance to lead the Labour Party in opposition, I will make us once more a powerful opposition to this Tory government, and I will restore us to a credible and radical socialist Labour government in waiting. If you put your faith in me, Up I top. will not let you down. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Jeremy Corbyn. Since the election last summer, our party has grown enormously. 300,000 new members have joined because they want to see this country governed and run in a different way. And that has had an effect. We've had victories in Parliament, we've had election victories in by elections, council elections, and mayor election, mayoral elections. And our party has to adapt to a new way of working. We are now such a large organisation, we've got to be and should be and must be involved in every single community in this country, in the issues they face, the campaigns they wage, and the demands that they make. I want our constituency parties to be outgoing and involved in their communities at all times, so that we can build and transform our society and give people the confidence that things can be done very differently in Britain. So, we start with a housing policy that works for all. Regulate the private rented sector. Invest in secure lifetime tenancies in council housing and give first-time buyers an opportunity to buy somewhere they can afford rather than having Tories, a Tory government that uh, keeps luxury homes empty as a land bank and allows people to sleep on the streets at the same time. Our railways being brought into public ownership so that we get the benefits and the profits from the enormous investment we've put in. Higher wages and a proper minimum wage that means something, £10 an hour that the TUC suggests. And then environmental, environmental protection policies that help to build a sustainable environment in Britain and we play our part in dealing with the global challenges. Civil rights defended and a foreign policy based on peace and justice. This is underpinned by a national investment bank and an investment strategy that creates decent jobs for all in all regions of Britain, a growing economy that can deliver public services for all. A dynamic socialist idea of how we bring about real change so nobody and no community is ever left behind.
to say now, thank you so much for everybody to come along this evening. I hope you'll agree with me that I think it's been a really informative and enjoyable discussion. Uh, thank you to both of the candidates for coming along, for offering your arguments. And thank you again to the audience um, for all coming along uh, on this evening. I think it's been a really great event. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs>